um, an even mightier gap down to minus 15, minus 25, or even uh, minus 40. Now, where can carbon pricing take us in that regard? Depends, of course, on the level of carbon price you assume. Um, just looking at the Treasury uh, modeling conducted two years ago, uh, the two arrows show you 2020 for the kind of lowest scenario and the highest price scenario. Uh, the uh, low price scenario, which gives you a $40 price in 2020, um, shows a small increase in Australia's actual uh, domestic emissions between 2000 and 2020. Uh, the one with the about $70 carbon price in 2020 gives you a small decrease, a small decrease, about 5% of the about in actual domestic emissions. Mm -hmm. Now, experience shows that most of the modeling done ex ante is actually too pessimistic, uh, and reality comes out better. Uh, better. There's, a, there's a good piece by Grattan Institute <coughs> uh, just, just recently. So perhaps this is too pessimistic, okay? Uh, but it would be a long stretch to expect uh, that we'd get all the way down to minus 15 or whatever uh, with, uh, with relatively moderate carbon prices. So how to bridge the gap? This is my last slide. Um, somewhere below the carbon prices and complementary measures will need to be investment uh, in overseas uh, mitigation action, buying offsets, buying permits in other countries. Um, and just as an illustration, um, if you want an extra 10% out of this, for instance, in order to go from minus 5 to minus 15 in Australia's net emissions after purchases, um, if you now assume that we're buying at the same price as what we're charging domestically under fixed price scheme, in order to pay for that, we need to set aside about 13% of domestic carbon price revenue. Okay. So, of course, very strong competing claims for the carbon price revenue. That's not overwhelming. It's large, but it's not overwhelming. Probably somewhere in, the, in, you know, in terms of these kinds of respective carbon price, in the area between a billion or two uh, per year in 2020. If you want to get further below, um, and I think there is no doubt that um, the Greens will want to see at least the possibility of going well below those kinds of uh, going well further, um, then it's probably land-based carbon that will have to come to the rescue, biosequestration. Now, um, it has been uh, surmised that there is enormous potential for this, but it's equally clear that that kind of potential in soil carbon, in forest management, uh, is very highly uncertain, and it's even more uncertain just what it will cost. Um, so I think it's difficult to rely on that um, in the pursuit of a binding national target. However, uh, it could uh, very readily form the basis for an additional pledge that Australia could make and that would fit quite well in the kind of bottom-up framework that we have under the Copenhagen Accord. Um, and that is exactly where I'll pick up in, in my talk this afternoon, in fact. So just to finish, a little bit of promotion. This is the new centre that we have uh, at the ANU Crawford School. Various papers on the issue uh, on the website there. We're organising a conference on these very issues uh, for the 31st of March. Thank you. Ten minutes for discussion. Um, as you are aware, uh, lunch is a bit slow, and uh, the uh, central lunch period is only 45 minutes. So, to in order in order to not encroach on our afternoon session, we'll have to uh, finish fairly quickly. <coughs> and I have a first question, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, see, after listening and, and, and the international, the geopolitics is starting from. Uh, casting doubt on the India and deforestation in Indonesia to Venezuela. If somebody asked me tomorrow, what is your emission of the pandemic policy in Australia? What shall I tell them that this is a taboo topic and our government change if we talk about it? I mean, we don't even have any emissions policy today. Like, like, nobody can say it is a climate change policy today because it has been withdrawn. Uh, the only policy we have is 20% uh, electrification policy, which people don't know that different regions, different states are following their own and, and that, that is over our 
passing through the first line got that is on or off. Plus, in addition to steps, so I really would like to know generally that what is our commission uh, reduction policy today. Number one, number two, John spent a lot of time on deciding what prices should be charged, what should be. Uh, all these uh, prices which came out of treasury modeling, I think they are based on elasticity of energy use prices. But the elasticity we know are true only at the margin. Elasticity of one fuel is true at the margin of the price at the same, but if we simplify of all fuels, then they may not be true and then they say twenty percent may be eighty twenty percent may be eighty dollars. Thanks. First part, perhaps Louise. What was the question? Do what is the policy? Yeah, I think the policy is clear. Is that what the policy on Australia's emission reduction. Uh, well, the, uh, the the government has a suite of things. Central to this is the carbon price. That's the way that we get to the five percent. You can't even you know imagine serious emissions reductions without a price on carbon. But there are those other things I mentioned: renewable energy, energy efficiency, and then working closely with our regional neighbours on things like deforestation. Oh, the 5% is absolutely there. The whole, the, the statement put out on the 5th of May by the Prime Minister still stands absolutely. Thank you. Steve, we'll answer the second part yeah. of the question. So, uh, okay. um, both, both bits. So, so the first point to make is Australia's already made substantial emissions reductions. Uh, okay, so... Uh, I haven't read the full uh, new emissions projection that came out I thought, yesterday, not this morning, but I'll let the bank take credit for getting up to it. Um, so it, it indicates in the order of 140 uh, megatons of abatement already achieved. Most of that's through energy efficiency. Uh, sorry, this is abatement from policies that have been implemented in the past, looking forward to 2020. Most of that's from energy efficiency policies of a range of kinds, and uh, a lot in appliances. Uh, there's a substantial chunk. Uh, from the renewable energy target, uh, and then there's some from land clearing, but land clearing is relatively important. On the elasticity point, I think it's important to understand what the modelling projects. Basically, the modelling projects that we choke off the growth in energy demand. It doesn't project uh, substantial reductions in Australian energy use. It does imply a trend fall in per capita energy use, but I think that trend fall is quite um, plausible. And so we're not we're not heavily reliant on sort of ambitious or optimistic elasticity assumptions. Thanks, Steve. Just one up the back there. Yeah. Um, since you heard from New Zealand, I have a question for Frank. One of the things that we found in our HS is that because the policy environment is incredibly uncertain, uh, people aren't responding to what the forestry sector actually very high carbon prices in New Zealand, but they're discounting those prices hugely because you make them a larger investment. And I wonder if it would be worth So I think that's a really essential point. It will come out in a, in a, in a joint paper with Steve and myself on, on these issues as well. So we've got to create that, um, that investment certainty and stable expectations of, of future prices. Now, um, before in my talk, I, I just mentioned the possibility on the tax-like scheme, like a fixed permit price scheme, to actually auction some, some of the future uh, permits as well. Uh, which will give you a, a nice measure of what market expectations are uh, about the stability of policy. So you've announced that you know, you're starting at X dollars <coughs> rising at 4% per year, so there is an emotional government trajectory. If they're also auctioning, um, then, then you can see what the market deviation is uh, in terms of what, what the market expects policy variation to be from the state of uh, policy of the United States. Um, but look, I mean, fundamentally, you just have to overcome uh, this issue that successive governments might be tempted uh, to change policy along the way, uh, or at least you might, at least you need to over overcome the perception that this, this might be the case. Thank you. Uh, thank you.
Yeah. Jack Mizzy, um, a new slide to ask you, Frank, <coughs> with your fixed permit scheme, do you think there's any chance that it can avoid ending up with such a high proportion of giving away free permits and also giving away in such distortionary ways as mm -hmm. we ended up with the CPIs in December 09? And if so, why? I mean, I'm hoping the answer is yes, but um, just wondered if you thought about that. Shouldn't be any worse than any of the alternatives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but could it be substantially better? Or is it, do you anticipate that the politics is just going to be as bad as before? Look, I mean, the, the one thing, part of the argument for free permits, part of it, uh, is that there is the risk of very high carbon prices. Okay? You've taken that out of the equation. Um, the other, perhaps, part of the puzzle. Uh, is that if you choose the low starting price that accelerates quickly, okay, then uh, government has more of a leg to stand on in terms of saying, well, the impacts in the short term that we're hitting you with uh, aren't actually that great. Um, and it's a question of, of transition um, and, and substitution and, and, and smoothly moving into that. So I think there's, there's two strong arguments. Um, extra arguments for, for government uh, to, to strengthen uh, spines, essentially. Yes.